Hey, insiders, I'm Emma Capotis. And I'm Michael Julian. Welcome to the Festival Insider Podcast, a podcast for insiders by insiders. Today, we are officially kicking off our interviews, and we have a very special person lined up today. I would say we're starting on a very high note. Wouldn't you say the same, MJ? I don't know. You know, <laughs> don't fly too high, don't fly too low. But I do know that he's a very special person in our industry. Mm-hmm. You know, I have worked with him for some time and really was fascinated by what this guy can do. And mm-hmm. I'm very, very excited to hear his story of how he got here and what he's up to these days. And I think it's a great first interview. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm really, really excited. I feel like to come out of the gate, like we said, we're going to be bringing on industry professionals, artists, content creators, like all different types of people with different types of backgrounds. But um, Rutger, who is going to be on today, has such a long history of festival production under his belt. So we have a ton of questions to ask him about his work and just his story in general. And, you know, we're going to ask him about advice for people who want to be in the same position as him. But um, we'll let him dive into all of that when he joins us in just a few minutes. But any other words about Rutger? He has a nice beard. (laughs) Perfect. With that being said, we'll roll uh, right into the interview here with uh, Rutger. Uh (laughs) Aha. Just promised everyone that man was a really nice beard. And look, I'm (laughs) delivered. Beards are sexy, right? (laughs) <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice to meet you. Good morning. Nice to meet you. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. We're excited. You are our first big interview here on the podcast. So we're starting out on a high note. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't listen too much to MJ though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say MJ is going to do a nice uh, introduction here to kick us off. Um, but yeah, MJ, you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, guys. So Rutger, to me, I've known him now for some time. And he's been like, you know, onion comparison with a lot of layers. That's been Rutger. Mm -hmm. And the more I know him, the more I learn about him, the more I actually get fascinating about how talented this man really is. He's so humble, you'll never know. And Mm -hmm. it's all wrapped in jokes. But in reality, he's uh, just such a loyal friend and such a great guy, but even more so... He's an amazing leader. And, you know, I can't wait for him to tell us the story because I don't know most of it still. But what I can tell you is, you know, from the small group of people at the Electric Zoo, he was there to help us bring up the animal stages. We may not have ever had them if it wasn't for him. And, um, you know, with that same group of people, we brought Electric Zoo and those stages to Asia and to South America and, you know, that was a very interesting journey there at SFX. A lot of things happened, but um, Rutger is also behind Backbone, which I can't wait for him to tell all of us mm-hmm. about. And, you know, Backbone team was there in Japan producing electric. So I don't even think he was there, but he's, the team was there. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, uh, it's been such a pleasure to work with him. And, you know, it's been um, really good to have this friendship as well, because in this industry, we, we all like family and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm happy that he's the first one that we're talking to. I think it's a great start. Yeah. So, uh, join us in welcoming Rutger to the podcast. How you doing? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> um, uh, well, th- thanks for those kind words, my friend. And uh, likewise. Yeah. You know, I don't say MJ, that. Nice MJ is a great friend, friend of mine and, uh, there's not actually, it's a small world, but at the same time, um, you don't have a, a lot of real friends in this world. Mm-hmm. Uh, MJ is definitely a real friend. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Well, we want to know a little bit more about your story and sort of take it back a little bit. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got into the festival industry and the live events industry? Sure. Uh, it's It's probably close to 25 years ago where... Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where I'm from, uh, the dance industry was really coming to fruition right around then. Um, there was just not a lot of technology to to uh, to express all the 
creativeness that was in everybody's head um, mm -hmm. when I started. Um, well, actually, I'm, I'm a civil engineer. And it's where I started out. Okay. Um, when I made the step into this world, uh, I, actually, I was actually running a big demolition company. Um, and uh, uh, we did great projects that um, I, I've never done anything normal. So, <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm very, I need to be challenged all the time because I got bored like really fast. We were just talking uh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and and even then I, I did like the weird projects that nobody wanted to take on like the big the biggest chimneys in 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 the in the highest populated areas or or big concrete uh bunkers um that needed to be blown up yep <laughs> Um, so I, I was always in the special projects already, and uh, and then I, I decided I wanted to move to a, re a really small town in the Netherlands, and I ran into this guy that owned uh, with his brother owned a, a sound company, and uh, and he we got we got we became friends and uh, we talked and talked and he's like, geez man, I, I need you to run my company," hmm. and um, but he he couldn't afford me. Basically, not that I was asking us like big amounts or something, but mm -hmm. um, it was just a small company and uh, it was growing. But he, there were technicians; they were not people that run ran companies. So, um, so we came up with a solution. We started a production company, and I would be um, that was my company, um, and everything that wasn't sound would go through this company. So we worked together. I did the management for both companies, and they um, they they worked on the projects in those bo in both companies, and that's how I I became the owner of a production company. And uh, and back in the days, like the the bigger festivals, it was just a rolling scaffolding with some fabric on it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, projection. We didn't have video uh, projection or even um slide projectors or 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 movie uh projectors like stuff like that we were just really being creative with the stuff that we had back in the days and that's well, how we started mm -hmm. how big was the first event i think my my first the biggest event that i did was like eighteen thousand people and and that was already quite big um uh, back in the days uh, and we grew it to 40,000 people. And there's not a lot of festivals in, in Europe at the mm -hmm. time that were bigger than, than 40,000 people. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how it started. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. 18,000 people sounds like a lot, but compared to what you're doing now, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like unreal. For EDC, we sell 180,000 tickets a day. Right. So, wow. And yeah. that's, that's huge, right? <laughs> Do you feel the same way about projects now? Do you still like to take on more challenging products, uh, projects that other people wouldn't normally do? <laughs> I have to. Yep. I have to in order not to get bored. Like, um, right. Otherwise, I'll find other stuff. I'll just... I just find my way through the difficult project. <laughs> <laughs> what was the year when it went from... What you were just saying now that there was no projections, it was it was like getting really creative, and the technology wasn't yet in a place where you can start making, you know, innovative, very innovative things. When was the beginning of that era where you 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 got the technology to start making things change? Mm -hmm. I think it's. Well, project well, a video and such happened earlier, but the biggest change was when I, I got asked by Tomorrowland um, to help them out with their festival. Uh, it was really small still, and it was a two-dimensional stage. It was just scaffolding with banners and some video in it. And they asked me um, to help them out create 3D stages. So that's when we started sculpting and, and going into the scenic stages. I built this, the first scenic stage for, uh, for Tomorrowland. Wow. Um, so we, we started sculpt, really sculpting. Um, 
and uh, and that's why that's kind of where it really started. I was there bog backbone, or this is before backbone. That's that's before backbone. That was me as a with my company. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason that Tomorrowland guys knew me is because I I was touring with Armin uh, mm-hmm. back in the days, and I was very much used to difficult productions because we traveled with our production to God know where (laughs) every continent, every crazy city, every crazy country. uh, And we had to make adjustments based on the the available materials locally. Mm -hmm. Um, So we did a show for, for, for the Tomorrowland guys, an Armin show in, in Belgium. And that's how we got to know each other. And like, okay, so if we need, if we, we're going to start getting into the more difficult production stages, we won't have him on board. And that's when they got me. Incredible. You know, Armin yeah. used to be, Armin shows and, you know, eventually ASAP shows were really stood out. Like they really, yeah. even in New York, you know, they were impactful. And, and, and I think that's when we met the first time in New York. What is it? Was it Madison Square Garden or was Rosa? Madison. Yeah, it was Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Armand sold out Madison Square Garden. If I'm not mistaken, that was the first time an electronic music artist sold uh, Madison Square Garden yeah. by an independent promoter. So there was a lot of history in that show. Yeah. Wow. Not surprised. He's still amazing to this day. <laughs> how big of a team did you have back then, too? Like, how many people would you be traveling with for his shows? Uh, we would travel with like 30 people, but I think that would include dancers. That would include everything, right? Okay. So, um, and I would include my technical guys that would travel with me from off day one of load in. That's supposed to like a five five guy team, okay. uh, and then, and then we would basically come in on like a Monday, um, start building. And then on a Friday, we would have rehearsals with the dancers. So the dancers and everything would come in on Thursday and, uh, and, and upper management. And uh, we would have the show ready and then do the show basically on Saturday night, usually Friday or Saturday night, or depending how successful, maybe Friday and Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And then we would fly out to the next gig on Sunday again. So we would always skip a night or two. Um, and then... Uh, <laughs> And then travel to the next continent. Jeez. Yeah, I don't think you ever change that. Do you, do you sleep now much? Because you know, <laughs> when I talk to you, I mean, like, like six in the morning, your time, you're already there looking fresh. I six in the morning, I look like somebody <laughs> took a hammer and like beat me up most of the night. No, I start my day at five five thirty. Yeah. Wow, that is crazy. And then take us through the rest of like your career and your journey. When did um, Backbone come into play? Okay. Yeah. So I, I, um, I produced, uh, for Armin, mm-hmm. I produced for Tomorrowland because usually the, the summers, so the summer is the season in the, in, in the Netherlands and Europe, uh, for festivals. Mm-hmm. It also means that, uh, that touring usually stops. No touring happens in the summer because it's, it, it's just festival gigs for the DJs. So I would have time to produce festivals, uh, of which one was obviously Tomorrowland. Um, I also had a couple of other companies. So I I had a a dome company here in the US and in Europe. Uh, I also had a security company, an event security company. My thing is always like if if something doesn't work, um, either Either you don't, you, well, I don't like complaining. And if I hear myself mm-hmm. complain too much, I need to change it. And I didn't get companies to change. It was both for the you know, dome company as well as for the security company. I'm like, you know what? I'll just do it myself. And um, so I started that company. That company, the security company, um, I did it with a promoter friend of mine who was not, never happy either. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we started that company together, um, and then he got bought by ID and T in the Netherlands, um, or at least partially. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's like, "You know what? Let's let's include ID and T into our security company as well. Um, have them become a partner." 
which they did. And we did that for a couple of years. And, and, uh, and air, all my partners were always looking at me to run this company. But at the same time, I was producing festivals. I was touring. I was, I had another dome company, which I was running. <laughs> and like, I, I, I never slept anymore. Like I don't yep. sleep a lot, but I never, I stopped sleeping by then. <laughs> <laughs> and I had an issue in Australia. I was a touring in Australia with Armin, and then one of my guys, an important guy in my in my security company, screwed up. And then all of a sudden, like I had to really actually day by day run this company. Wow. Like, you know what? I need to get rid of this company. <laughs> I'm over it so much. <laughs> I had 450 people working in that company, and it's just it's just horrible. It's just horrible. But whatever. Mm -hmm. Um so I sold the dome company. I sold the, um, uh, and my partners, ID and T uh, and, and the other partner, uh, we decided to sell it and, uh, we got out and then to round off the negotiations, I had a, a, a conversation with ID and T, um, and they were like, so now what, right? Uh, mm -hmm. All of a sudden I had time, which I didn't, but. <laughs> uh, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to focus on just production alone. Just production. I, I don't want to be bothered with any side business anymore. Right, right. And they said, well, if you have time, can you please come with us? We're going to, we're going to, they were in negotiations with SFX at the time, but they already had plans to move to the US and open an office in New York. Mm hmm. And they were like, okay, so now we're going to bring some of our concept, like Sensation, Mystery Land. Uh, and a couple of other things to the U.S. Are, do you want to produce that for us? And I'm like, sure. I mean, I like the U.S. I love working there, and I think you can change a lot there because that's always my like. I so, the, so the sensation in Brooklyn, that production was you as well. Yeah, yeah, that was that was special. <laughs> And um, so that, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, we could, uh, Tomorrowland. Um, had the ambition to go to the US as well. And uh, mm -hmm. and they asked me, so what if we would do tomorrow night in the US? Could you produce that? I'm sure, I'm, yeah, sure, yeah, I can do that. I can do it in Europe, I can do it in uh, in the US, right? So, right. Um, but at the same time, they asked me that in December um, and I was traveling in Brazil, I think, and um, I flew into Atlanta where the potential location was and mm -hmm. they asked me if that was the right location for us to produce the festival and if I was willing to do it uh, and and willing to do it was starting January because they wanted to have that show already in September. Wow. And that all, everything happened at the same time. And you know what? I'm over touring right now. I'm, I'm really done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, I'm, I'm just going to do it. So I said yes, and then we, and based on that, they uh, they planned the, the the festival for September in thirteen. Mm -hmm. And I moved to the states, and uh, um, but oh okay, yeah, one step back, uh, ID and T in the Netherlands had a company called Backbone, which was a really small in-house production company that pro basically produced all their shows in in Europe. And um, and they hired me and my company sometimes to just help them out with stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but we started talking. So we have an in-house company. We want you to go to yes. You know what? Why don't we Why don't we merge our companies? Um, so we merged my company with uh, Backbone, wow. and uh, and then a third company we merged into it as well. Uh, another an, another guy uh, that had a production company in the Netherlands, and we decided that he would run Europe, I would run the US, mm -hmm. and then the third partner that used to run Backbone already, or actually started the company, uh, would go to Asia and start up business there. And you guys did a lot of stuff. It wasn't just the festivals, although, right? I recall. I don't know if it was Olympic Games or something like 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 of that magnitude, maybe. Am I thinking? No, it was Sale in Amsterdam, which is a huge event every five years. Um, but also um, a, a lot of, uh, yeah, we toured a lot of, of concepts for id &T and obviously involved in Tomorrowland, which was a biggie. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we did 
also soccer events and uh, for the UEFA, uh, for for a lot of big sponsors like Heineken um, wow. uh, at the Olympic Games. Um, so there was like a, the Holland House, as they call it, at every Olympic Games, where all the athletes and uh, and the artists that perform during the Olympics come and every night there's a party and during the Olympic Games and all the medal um, and ceremonies would happen there and uh, our, our king or our, our queen at the time uh, would be there and like stuff like that. And guys, you should check out, I know Backbone actually is very active on social and LinkedIn and they always post. Uh, production photos, you should check it out to see the magnitude of, of, of what it is now. It's it's really fascinating. I think it is. <laughs> so you, I, was I wouldn't say, say that if it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're just transfixed by your story right now. What was the transition like coming to the United States and doing production like that, especially for Tomorrow World? Was the original idea to try and create the exact same experience in the United States or were you approaching it differently as far as like the stage design? No, no, it had to be a, an identical uh, experience. Identical. Okay. Yeah. But we kind of screwed ourselves uh, and were naive in the days. Uh, we just thought we just copy and paste it. Mm -hmm. um, and the budget, we just added 30% to the budget, the, the Belgian budget. And uh, we said, oh, let's go, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be 300% or so. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Producing yeah. something in the U.S. is so much more expensive than it is in Europe. It's crazy. But I recall the festival, I mean, I wasn't there, but I recall the festival in the first year was actually done really well. I, you know, the sales and other concerns i understand but the festival itself i think went really well the first year no yeah well a lot of shit happened mm -hmm. gotcha. um so one of our biggest challenges was i mean everybody knows the moreland knows the book stage and that was our first stage that we would use it uh in atlanta um the the it, the design was not based on touring it it was a one-off and, uh, and, and the whole design was just based on materials that are only available in Europe. Okay. Um, so we, we, we already knew that we had to travel the deco, all the scenic pieces, but we found out that um, it, was, it was cheaper for us to ship in all the steel and all the scaffolding and everything uh, from Europe. Um, as well, because I could not, like, whatever we could find and wasn't even enough was on the other side of the country and had to travel for three days and was just a ridiculous amount of money. It was cheaper for us to get it from Europe. So <laughs> our touring set was a hundred containers. And uh, yeah, that's, yep. that's a crazy, that's, uh, that's crazy logistics. And um, and we got, we kind of, we got fucked um, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, customs held up 28 containers. Oh. Oh. Yeah, and they were sitting in in the in the harbor for two weeks before they released them. Wow! And it was a week before show. Oh God! I was going to ask. For those of you guys out there that complain about that the festival has 70 headliners, <laughs> you know, and not 18, this is the struggle of putting an event together. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it was crazy, and we actually we at one point almost thought we could not make it. Like, and also the the, the engineering for the stages was another thing that um, we have a lot of people that don't know that we have to deal with. Yeah. So especially in 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 rural um, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, convincing building inspectors that this is safe what we do is kind of a thing because they wanted the engineering to be based on permanent structures and it's just okay. impossible to get what we build um uh, engineered on because that means like 100 miles an hour wind loads and like you know what uh 40 miles an hour the site is empty <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I think engineering only needs to be up like to 70 miles an hour, which makes a huge difference because after 70 miles an hour, if you want to get engineering where it needs to be, um, you need to invest so much money and effort in it. It's just, it's just crazy. It's just not doable. We cannot afford a festival anymore. So that convincing took forever as well. Um, so we were just struggling with getting the permitting done and, and, uh, and the engineering signed off on. Yep. Yeah, I can relate to the struggle where the budget goes so high up. <laughs> You're just basically facing a reality that is, you just becomes undoable, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those were the struggles in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, we got there, but man, <laughs> where I can pray. And then what the big one after that was Mystery Land, right? I'm just trying to, to remember. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So yeah, we had the sensation shows, uh, but as, at the same time we had uh, uh, Mystery Land uh, for the next year mm -hmm. uh, in 14. Uh, and that was another one where rural area, uh, people that don't know anything. It was just a struggle to get. I to. feel it was mm -hmm. a lot of like miss judging that Europe can be duplicated in America and just work as a carbon copy of it. You know, I think there was a lot of uh, local differences that just wouldn't work. But that festival site, I still think is the most beautiful festival site I've ever seen, honestly. And uh, mm -hmm. the, like you could scale and do such a big festival on that, on that location. And, and the festival itself was produced really well. You know, I think, I think uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the production and stages and everybody I know who went there, including me, I went there and I don't go to even our own event. I went there because it was, I just, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. It was just such a beautiful park, uh, not park, greenery. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, everybody that went had an amazing time. It's just a location. It was difficult. Um, uh, but, and the concept of Mystery Land is, is not the names. Uh, it's the festival that you need to buy tickets right. for, not the artists that are coming there. Right. And that I think was also a little bit, bit, bit of a miscalculation in the Netherlands. That's how it works. Uh, you don't need a lineup to sell out your festival. Mm -hmm. uh, you go for the experience and the quality and you know what you're getting. It'll be fine. Artists will be fine. Yep. And here, and we came to the U.S. and all of a sudden headliners were important. And we had to, str we had to struggle booking artists um, in the U.S. that were, like, at the be especially back in the days, Vegas was really screwing in with, with our, our fees for our uh, artists. Hmm. Uh, playing in a casino or in a casino, in a, in a nightclub in Vegas would give them so much money. I think the, 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 the artist fees were almost double if you cross the ocean. Uh, so we were not used to that either. Um, yep. I was thinking that the residencies there are just absolutely insane. How much money these guys make. Yeah. I mean, Armin would make like half a million dollars in a night. Right. And then I would talk to Hakkasan guys and like, geez, man, you're screwing up my business here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we don't so, care. So ironic. We, yeah. we don't care because we make so much money every night, even right. paying those fees. It, mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine now, but I remember when we went to Vegas and we started doing events there um, with our team. I don't recall having, there were very little clubs inside of the casinos. There were mostly lounges, lounges. Mm -hmm. Well, like there was a rum jungle in Mandalay and like a couple of exceptions. Yeah. And that's because the casinos believe that if you bring the clubs inside, they'll lose their revenue from gambling. Can you imagine how that <laughs> mindset where all these years they could have probably done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but someone said that mindset is no change. But yeah, once Vegas opened up and they realized how much money that was, that really started affecting all the fees. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I have a question about timeline as well. So when you, how soon is your team on site for like a mystery land or tomorrow world? Like when do you, how long is the construction process? 
the uh, well, Tomorrowland. It kind of depends on what kind of festival you do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, because there's a lot of scenic in the main stage of Tomorrowland, is like humongous. Right. Um, that kind of dictates your timeline. Um, so we would build for close to six weeks on wow. a, on the main stage. Okay. And then we would not start anything else on site. Uh, just start on the main stage because everything else can be done in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, that makes sense. How do you deal with the, cause I, this has happened with, um, EDC Las Vegas. How do you deal with people now who, uh, ruin the festival production with spoilers? Like they're flying drones in or they're driving by and getting pictures of the production before it's actually released. And so people get to see a sneak peek at the stages before they're done. Well, there's nothing. Well, of course you can do something about it. I mean, yeah. you can warn them and they'll get fired if, if they share any pictures online. Yep. Or, um, but and the drones, we have, we can catch drones now really easy. So <laughs> <laughs> we got the te- we got the technology for that. So okay, um, I don't think it's a biggie, and sometimes it also helps. Mm-hmm. Sneak this is peek true. help. Like you know, nowadays, we we a lot of times we do sneak peeks even ourselves, right? Yep. Um, I always look. I can't not look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to know in advance. Um, okay. So you've done some other incredible events. I, I want to ask you some questions about, uh, I know you worked on Camp EDC as well, which is a little bit of a different experience than doing festivals. Can you talk about that production? Sure. Um, so obviously I'm now, I'm now with Insomniac, right? Mm-hmm. Um let me tell you a little bit of a history there. Um, so when when I came to the US, uh, Pasquale basically already reached out, uh, the CEO and, own, and, and owner of, of Insomniac. Um, because back in the days, EBC was definitely not where it was supposed to be. And looking at the festivals in Europe, it was so far behind. Mm-hmm. Um, he reached out to me and he asked me if I wanted to work on, on their events, but I was in a good place. Uh, I was working with Tomorrowland and I didn't want to work with any, any other promoter, basically I had my hands full and also there's the loyalty and other festivals don't tend to like you working on, on festivals of the competition for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, so he reached out and in the years we just kept talking. And uh, because I always think that uh, you need to have, like, competition is not the enemy. Uh, I, I think if we, if, if for instance, Insomniac would be the only promoter there is, it would not be healthy at all, right? We need to trigger each other and it's good for the market. Mm-hmm. Um, so we always kept talking and uh, I wanted to know what, what was going on. I would go to their events and check it out. Not under the radar, just obvious, like be there and just see it. And, uh, and that's how I am too. Like I, I'm here to share. I don't care. Uh, I'm ahead of the game anyways. If you believe in yourself, yep. you're not going to catch up. <laughs> right. So no, no secrets there, in my opinion. Um, so th- that's how we, he, he contacted me back in the days and we kept talking. Um, at one point, um, uh, I uh, I quit my job with, with SFX and I was basically open to do whatever. Um, mm-hmm. and I was up for a new challenge. Um, and SFX was actually lifestyle at the time when I quit. Um, but um, next day I got, when the word got out, I have to say, uh, I got a phone call like, hey, we need to talk. So we, we started talking and I think it was in January, 18, I think, January 18, I think. And um, um, we had, uh, the summer was already being worked on. Like everybody was already working. There was not really a role for me to jump in right away. Um, like take on a full project or so, everything, everybody was already working on their own projects. Mm-hmm. Um, but Every time they had some shit going on, they would call me if I could help them out. So I started doing that with a couple of things. Okay. But I do. When the shit goes wrong, I call you to help you. <laughs> 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 yeah. And that was actually the first year, 18 was the first year that they, they, they did Camp EDC. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I think the, the, first, the camping experience was okay. 
I, I wouldn't want to say great, but it was okay. But the whole logistics around it was just so fucked up. Uh, people would be sitting in their cars for nine to 10 hours to get in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and since I was talking to them directly, like, uh, okay, I mean, there's nothing we can fix here on site. Well, we did a little, but uh, not major. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you do, maybe you should produce Camp EDC next year. I'm like, sure, I'm, I'm all in. Uh, I really want to do that. Um, but then you need to give me the ranks. I need to have full authority. I need to be able, like, I don't want to have overlapping vendors from your end that you want me to work with, or I want to create my own project. I don't want to be bothered by anyone. I want to be involved in the marketing part, in the programming part, and in, in, the, in, in the food selection, like in every detail of Camp BDC. So I came up with a plan. They okayed it and we executed it. And uh, for starters, the lines, um, people getting in, like if you would enter the festival site mm-hmm. until you were at your camping spot, either your tent or your RV spot, was 20 minutes max. So nice. And we did so much more tickets uh, already. Yep. Uh, and um, so that's that's how that happened. And uh, that's why I wanted to do it. It was just, it was my my creation. Uh, uh, I, I really wanted that. Like I don't I don't want to have anybody tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. That's not what then rent and then hire somebody else, right? So you take me for my knowledge. Wow. And um and that's actually when when uh when they're like, oh geez, this we want this at every festival. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um yep. and and they wanted to reel me in and say, hey, we want you and Backbone to be involved in every project project. And um, it's just, that's just difficult. And then the more we talked, the more we talked, the, the organization was just not where it had to be. Like they started transforming Insomniac to what it is right now, uh, two years prior to that. And, uh, and, and the marketing and, and a lot of other, and the, and the artist departments, and they got a handle on that, just not on production yet. And the more we talked, the more they were like, geez, man, I mean, we need you in our company, not just backbone. We need you in our company. And that's at one point where I decided, okay, I'm going to take this challenge mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and get Insomniac really where, where it is now. Uh, this year was supposed to be uh, an amazing year. Like we, we mm-hmm. in the last two years, we grew our festivals, all our festivals, at least by 30%. Uh, and and uh, some doubles even. So, and more and more events. And, and uh, now I get the chance to be to be involved in stuff that happens in our clubs. We, we buy clubs, we open mm-hmm. clubs, we... Uh, we're talking to other partnerships and other festivals. We partnered in Okeechobee Festival. Uh, have great, great plans with that and the, and the location and the venue, um, as well as uh, growing growing our brands uh, on the East Coast. We were very much focused on California. Mm-hmm. Yay! excited (laughs) (laughs) so very much east coast yeah there's a lot gonna happen on the east coast awesome that's so exciting to hear i I have a question about the camping experience too because you one of the challenges with that is obviously you're in las vegas in the summer in a parking lot which you have to transform into this like beautiful oasis of a space so what were some of the um challenges that that came with creating that experience yeah, well, actually, this is this, that's that's kind of that's that, those are the challenges I really like. Like, mm-hmm. who comes up with having a camping in the freaking <laughs> desert yep. on asphalt? Like, really, um, that's that's not a worse place. You can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that came with a, a whole bunch of challenges, right? So one of the decisions was wait that um, move the festival from June to May. Mm-hmm. Uh, which made sense anyways, in my opinion. Because um, June, there's days that it's 120 degrees, right? Uh, it's just Brutal. unbearable. Especially yep. when you can maybe party, 
uh, but working is just crazy. Um, but yeah, so so how do you turn that into an oasis? It's just being by being creative. Like if you do the if you do the number if you do if you create the concept and you think oh you know what I don't want to see the asphalt I want to cover it with astroturf or artificial turf. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of money. So I had to be creative, and we we so we came up with a, with so we ordered it from the factory. And uh, we negotiate such a deal that I I sell it at, right after the event. I sell it for more than I, what I bought it for. <laughs> wow, smart. So yeah. all of a sudden, it's not a cost. It's a revenue. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's being creative in, in that way because it's, 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 uh, it's, it's over a million square feet of turf right Mm -hmm. those are the biggies tents we have four and a half thousand tents we need to put them up uh but there needs to be a power socket in there like Mm -hmm. there's a lot in going to get that power socket in there there's a a huge distribution of power and and because and then you need actually need two because you you also need an ac in there so there's four and a half thousand acs in on that campground and and it's just it's sheer it's the numbers that are yep. making this one difficult for sure. And then the winds that we have in May, April and May, mm-hmm. you know, because you need a lot of time to put up four and a half thousand tents in asphalt. Like right. Staking is a thing, right? Um, in different parts of the parking lot where we do it, uh, every every part of the uh, parking lot is different. There's a different thickness to the asphalt that you have to go through. It's like there's all kinds of techniques to get those those stakes in the ground. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was going to say, MJ, you're so right uh, about the appreciation. Like, like, as I'm trying to envision it, my head. Uh, yeah, he's got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, but all that, it's, uh, yeah, as you're talking, you know, I don't want to interrupt you. As you're talking, I'm having a headache also because I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, wait, these guys are doing stuff in Europe now. They obviously doing nonstop festivals on West Coast. Now they have East Coast. I mean, how big is the team? It's, it sounds like an insane overtaking. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why I don't sleep. <laughs> yeah, this is why I get up at five in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is this is incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and you know, he he's too humble, so he's missed a lot of stuff in between. And, and you know, like I said, probably. <laughs> Not only were we able to successfully see Electric Zoo in uh, China and Brazil, where a lot had to be figured out for same, you know, concerns that you're saying now is, you know, we had to figure out whether we build a new stage or ship the stage or how. We also did Awakenings in New York indoor, which was in Manhattan and the Roseland and the old theater, and nobody thought that was a good idea. But that worked out really well, you know? Yeah. And, and just so much in between. You know, one of the reasons why we started the podcast Mm -hmm. is because a lot of people are reaching out to me and they're saying, look, we're incredibly passionate about the festivals and events and music Mm -hmm. and we'd love to do this for a living. Like, what do we need to do to work with people like you in an organization like yours? And that's something I respond to people and it sounds almost like I convinced them not to do it. And the reason why is because I want them to see all the possible challenges so that they understand that this is not a walk in the park. And I say, oh. are you sure mm-hmm. you want to do this or do you want to have Instagram pictures on the stage for your friends? And I think the reason why like Rutger mm-hmm. and, and, and is a perfect guest is everybody can understand how much it takes, you know, uh, you have family, you know, you have a son and you have to give up so much for this events to sound and look and just have the, you have, this is a commitment of a lifetime. And so, you know, I think my question to, to everyone in this podcast and you are the first one is like, what advice can you give to those who are really want to get into this and work on production? Because a lot of people actually want to work in production. You know, what advice can you give them and what do they need to be prepared for and 
what is it that they need to be ready to do besides committing the time and you know ability to learn or adjust or like what advice can you give to someone who is 25 finished school has a degree has a head on their shoulders and really wants to do this for the right reason yeah no i uh, i hear you and uh yeah i obviously i get that question uh what do i need to do and how do i get there and you know what uh, it's 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 kind of difficult i think i am where i am because i wasn't a raver um, I am where I am because I didn't use drugs. Um, this business is very sexy. Um, it, it, it looks very sexy. The end product is very sexy. Mm -hmm. To get there is really not sexy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's challenging. And if you like challenging challenges, mm -hmm. if you're willing to work hard and give up a lot of free time, because you don't have a lot. Like, yeah, I had none. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's healthy, but that's just how I am, and that's how I'm how, how I'm wired, right? I, I I can I have to work. Like, I have to be working on shit. Like, I have to. Um, you need to give up a lot. It's not a walk in the park at all. Um, um, I was always a bit of the bummer, right? I was always a bit of the, in, in every aspect of everything. Like I, I would be the, I, I, I work with creatives. Like I'm part of the creative team, but I'm always the one that have to come with solutions. Like mm -hmm. in, especially uh, in the old days. <laughs> hold on, I got it. So number one thing was Rutger. I, I, I shit you not. When I have a question and I don't know what to do, and I go to him, there's a one word he's always said to me, doable, doable. Yeah. <laughs> that was the key. I said, Rutger, and he was just looking and said, doable. <laughs> if it's not doable, he would not say doable. Right? But, but, but doable, there's, there's many aspects to that, right? Doable, everything is basically doable, but I can only say doable when I, when I also think you can afford it. Fair. But yeah. there's a lot of thought behind that. Like I, like scenic. If if our creators come up with something scenic, there's shit floating in the air, and I need to make sure that it's gonna float there, right? <laughs> how do I get it there, and how does it float? Right. Where do I hang it from, right? There's nothing to hang it from. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's obviously. That's so. I'm a bum. I'm a bummer on that end because I'll tell them that that's not just not not possible, or it is possible, but it will cost you this. Mm -hmm. And if it and I because I always have the full budget, um, I can tell them okay, then let's do it this way. But then you cannot do this <laughs> because we just don't have enough money. Because um, otherwise, the ticket price will go up and we won't sell the tickets, right? Mm -hmm. it's it's that and then at the same so i'm i'm usually a bit of the the bummer there like i always the negative guy uh always like i, I don't like i feel the realist. Like sometimes. realist the realist <laughs> i like to call it a realist but mm -hmm. the creatives don't tend to think that way <laughs> um and at the same time if if we if the festival is done if the product is there and the doors are open we go through our first day and the first day is usually the most stressful one because we're still fixing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. As you find out while you go, when people are on site, you see issues. All of a sudden, people start plugging up in a certain corner of a festival. You need to reroute them a bit, put some fences there or change some stuff. Like, And then at the end of the night, everybody is in a, is a very euphoric uh, state and then they want to do an after party or they want to party or whatever because we look at this result mm -hmm. i don't do that like i don't go drinking i don't don't i don't do drugs at all i never did um because i might work mm -hmm. so i think i think also people need to understand that if you work in this business you're not going to be part of the party that's right you get a little and, after after and, party after you put things up and you can hardly stay on your feet because you're exhausted you get a yeah. couple of years and, and and that's the thing, and that's what people tend to think. It's like, okay, so, okay, I totally understand. Let's, we need to work our asses off and don't sleep and get the festival done. But then the, there's the festival. Oh, you don't get the party. 
And, uh, and there's some people that do, and we have our examples and it's not great. Uh, and, uh, and, and those are just not the team players either, uh, because in the end, we also need to clean up. Like a week later, the, the festival mm-hmm. site needs to be empty. Right. right? So uh, again, it's, it's, it's hard work. It's, I think it's super gratifying. Like I love it. Uh, I love the end result and I, I love to see 180,000 people enjoying themselves. It's just incredible. I get goosebumps every time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's good enough for me. Uh, but, it's Sounds not like as an amazing as advice. As you know? Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and like not everybody it. can do it. I like to see yeah. being practical. And they also ask me, like, what do I need to go? What What do I need to do in school uh, mm-hmm. in order for me to be ready to go into this business? And if you look at what I do, I think I have the ideal uh, background where I'm, I'm a civil engineer. I... Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, this is what I do. I build projects. It's the same as in civil engineering. You build a team around you with specialists. I don't know everything. I just I just make sure that I have the right people around me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and then building that team and then building those like it's it's very much the construction side, right? So it's just a bit of a different one. But I like I like people to be technical. I like them like mechanical engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh, civil engineering and uh, if you if you go that route you cannot go wrong in any part of the business because it's it's the mind that can solve stuff it's that's right. how that, that's how they train you in those kind of uh, uh, directions like if you if you do that amazing that's what I was going to ask you what does it take to to be a team member for you or what kind of skills but now it sounds like you need a <laughs> a pretty good background in engineering or something like that no, I, it would help. You don't need it. Like I have okay. examples where people don't have that education, but do mm-hmm. have that mindset. Yep. If you don't, if you did not decide yet what direction you want to go, I think that's a great direction. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, I see people that have some kind of an event education. You can throw that in the corner, in my opinion, because you're gonna really learn it at day one. You probably learn more half a year in working than you mm-hmm. do in four years in college. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I was going to say a lot of it has to be on, on the job learning. And before we let you go, I, I am curious, given the current state of the world right now, what does your day-to-day look like and what are you currently working on? Are you at home right now? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, I'm, I'm almost busier than ever. Uh, wow. Not outside building events, but coming up with solutions on how do we get through COVID? Right? How do we survive as a company? We have a big responsibility. We have a huge company. Um, same time, we need to get, keep some cash coming in. Um, so we're, we're creating concept. We have drive-in stuff. We have a, a big drive-through experience that we came up with mm-hmm. in LA that's really working out great. And uh, we extend, we opened from four now to seven days a week. Uh, and we sell out every night and uh, it's, it's, it's stuff like that that we're working on. And at the same time, this is a time for opportunities, um, um, both internally as well as external. So I have a big warehouse in, uh, in Vegas where I'm at right now and an office um, and get production up to par. Uh, we're gonna, in- I, I purchased a, a company uh, a little over a year ago, um, in my role f- uh, from Insomniac, like we 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 have a scenic company now in house. So I got them settled here in the building, and we're we're creating stuff already for our next EDCs. Um, but that's a whole undertaking. Same time, I'm looking at opportunities. I'm talking to other companies, maybe doing some takeovers. Um, stuff like that. I'm starting a new. A uh, rental company uh, because we have so many festivals, um, and that's the other thing. Um, if you compare Europe to the U.S., uh, the U.S. is so far behind if it comes to being smart with transportation and uh, and and just engineering the products that we use. It's mm-hmm. just it's just very old school. It's very 
it's just not smart. Um, for whatever reason, like in Europe, a lot of our vendors would be like max an hour away from the festival because everything is so relatively close. Uh, here in here in the US, we don't we don't care if it's a three days drive. Like really, mm -hmm. are we getting sound from the East Coast or from the West Coast or whatever? We drive it for three days. How does that work? Um, so I, I've worked on a lot of products in Europe over the years, um, and they have not come to this side of the ocean yet. Mm -hmm. So now I'm starting a rental company that is going to use all those products. I'm going to bring on all those, all those products. And it goes from simple uh, police fence or, or bike rack or um, barricades for stages or light towers even. Like I'm, I'm, I work, I have light towers that, that fit 22 on a truck instead of eight. Right? Those are big numbers if you, if you look at it year round and all the festivals that we do, just in transportation alone. They're fully automatic. Wow. So, what we do now is like, I was just flabbergasted. We have what, 600 light hours at EDC here in Vegas, and we have a guy turning them on and off every day. Really? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even. How imagine. does that work? So I have full automatic light towers that I've been working on. I've got some prototypes here that I'm going to invest in uh, that are fully automatic. And all of a sudden, I, I don't have to refill them anymore because they, they work 10 days in a row, 12 hours a day They can because they're fuel efficient. Amazing, yep. And solar power. And I'm very I'm, I'm big in, in, in all the sustainability. Like we're really, and I see so many opportunities in sustainability. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing is that... Um, a lot of people think that um, sustainability is expensive, and it's not. It, it, well, it can be if you don't do it right, but I think we can make money with sustainability. How, how sexy is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think this is where, you know, again, America, unfortunately, we are completely behind this, where the things that I know you guys are doing in the Netherlands too many years ago now is just now becoming a norm here. So, yeah. <laughs> It, it helps to have someone like you kind of lead that in the industry because I think everyone is following, like to follow. So it, it's great for, you know, I'm, as you know, me, uh, I'm very, I mean, sustainability is one of the most important things, right? Mm -hmm. To me as well. And I just, I really, that's a big focus of mine. And, and the thing, the good thing is like our fans are so young. Uh, we can, we can train them. I think there's mm -hmm. a responsibility for us Exactly. Like we train those people in doing the right thing. Like because you have the voice, them. right? Mm -hmm. They listen to you. Exactly. You are exactly. an authority. Yes. We're their gods, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's use that power and train them. Like garbage. Like how you split up garbage. Like mm -hmm. that, that's a, it's a really simple one. Just educate them. Educate them and show them that we do that, the same thing on our end. That's right. This is important, and this is partially what we're going to be doing here on Festo and Saturday as well. We have a couple of experts, and I'm funny enough, these guys are from New York who moved to Amsterdam because they couldn't get things going here. And now they live in Amsterdam, and they are consulting and advising American festivals on how to do it. You know, and, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll have them back as well. Emma, you have any more questions? <laughs> no, this is, I was going to say, I already have a deep appreciation for what you do, but now after this conversation, there will be absolutely zero complaints about any sort of <laughs> construction. It's amazing. I got, yeah. I got, I got two very important questions to mm -hmm. ask. Number one, and you have to be honest, are you angry at Tom Brady for leaving Patriots? <laughs> and number two is who's going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> the first one was what? Are you angry at Tom Brady for leaving Patriots? No. No. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Oh, you know why I chose the Patriots, right? Tell <laughs> us. Tell everybody. I didn't do it with my heart. I did it with my, with my mind. So I, okay. I just a small one. I don't know if we have time, but no, I, uh, in the Netherlands, I was born in Rotterdam. So I, was, I, I had to be for Feyenoord, the soccer team. There was no way around it. It's either it's fine or right. So, and they lost every freaking time. Like I was over losing. Um, actually, they became champion as soon as I 
Same thing, just pay, <laughs> whatever reason. But, uh, and then, uh, okay, who am, I love football. Now I'm here. I can see it every day, every weekend. Who am I going to ride for? Like, and like, who wins the most? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> who I've chosen the Patriots. <laughs> Are you a big Gamma Real fan? Who do you think is going to win Super Bowl? In all, in all honesty, I, I went away from the Patriots because it's just, I, I didn't like their look at politics and I didn't like, um, I, uh, I live in between uh, Fe- of, uh, Scottsdale, Vegas and LA now. Um, I, I picked the Raiders. That's right. That they're stadium looks amazing. And, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's really, I think they're going to be the, the next champion. They have the right coach. They have the right team. So who wins this year? Who's gonna win? You know what? You know what? <laughs> I still love Tom Brady. Yeah. Uh, I would not be surprised. It's either Kansas City or I, I think the Buccaneers make a chance. I I make a prediction. Buccaneers beat Bills in the Super Bowl, 35-29. Oh wow! Okay. That's what I said. I said maybe the Bills. That'd be interesting. I love the Bills. Yeah. <laughs> it would be interesting for sure. But I, I, the underdog Buccaneers, I'll, I'll count them out for sure. Yeah. Oh, man. I made a nice little wager a month and a half ago that the Super Bowl will be Bills and Buccaneers. If that happens, I will be very happy. Then I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, interesting. Man, this was really amazing. And I know mm-hmm. that Yeah, it was really nice to tell the story to everyone and at the same time to just again show people how much dedication and work and commitment it goes into doing this job and how long it takes to also get to the position where Rutger is now and we'll continue on that with more guests and we thank Rutger very much for being with us here today. We love you and uh, thank you for your support. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. No worries. Happy to do that. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. All righty. That was absolutely incredible. I, what a like high note to start out with. I think we got a lot of um, really important advice that I think a lot of people will find very valuable from Rutger. I think what's important for, for, for this context and for everyone that's watching is like, look, guys, this is the guy who has a, a family. He has a son, you know. And I can tell you that the dedication, you know, the 530 in the morning is not BS. He, he really is up that early, goes mm-hmm. to sleep late. It takes that much to really make it in this industry. Uh, you know, there are responsibilities on you. If you slack off, the event is not going to happen or something's not going to look the way it's meant to be. And you can't let the team down because it's so many different people and pieces of the puzzle that are involved in it you know you 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 it's really a teamwork and he is one of many and we will interview other people like him and you'll see uh everyone will say very similar things in terms of what is it that it took for them to stay into this and, and advance in, in their mm-hmm. career I think that it's fascinating that insomnia for insomnia to have one person to oversee production, considering how much they're doing, I can't even imagine what his days are like. But right. uh, I'm, I'm glad we started with him, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to do a lot more. What did you think, Anna? I agree. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't even imagine how big the team is that works under him. But I think whether you're listening as somebody in this industry or as a fan, I just think this probably gave you so much more insights into what actually goes into the creation of all of these events and how it differs in production from like a camping experience to a music festival to touring with an artist. I think it was really, really cool to hear everything from like things being caught up at customs and like shipping things internationally, like never would have thought about like that being a challenge. So it was really, really interesting to hear like what you're up against building these kinds of experiences. So the appreciation went up like tenfold. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, I've been in that situation. It's terrible when they're yeah. all this type of customs. But I think what I really want to ask everyone is like, guys, in the comments, let us know if there are any particular people you want us to scout for this and talk to them and you want to know their story, let us know in comments. You know, we, we're doing this for you. I think it's incredibly valuable to have 
people that have been through this speak and, and, and share their stories. And we're looking forward to bring a lot more and uh, do this for, for, for community, do it for, for everyone. I'm sure that the people that are already working in the industry on a more starting the starting role, just starting out, this is mm -hmm. inspiring as well as, you know, the fans that just want to know more about how the festivals work and what behind, what goes on behind the scene to the people that you know, want to get into this industry and start working. I think this type of interviews are going to be very helpful to tell us who you want us to speak with. And we have a great list of our own and we'll continue. Yes. And uh, the last thing from us, if you guys enjoyed this, again, we want to hear your feedback. You can get in touch with us at Festival Insider. Um, we're on YouTube. If you want to watch, leave comments, uh, and we would appreciate you rating and reviewing on Apple Podcast, all of the things. Share this with a friend today if you guys enjoyed it. Um, you can connect with MJ at the one and only on that was it, right? At the one and only? Yeah. <laughs> on Instagram. And I'm at Emma Capotis on Instagram. Um, and yeah, we will be back next week with another really incredible interview. And we've got some pretty cool um, topics as well that MJ and I are going to be discussing just the two of us. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye.